the ferry shows no sign of stopping. What the, what the? Oh. Everybody back! Everybody back! Nearly 400 miles off the coast of Alaska, a 93-foot fishing trawler, the Arctic Rose, is working in the stormy waters of the Bering Sea. Their second day here, they've already struck Bering Sea gold, a 10-ton catch of valuable flatfish. Captain Rundle's plan is to hold their position overnight so they can drop their nets in the same place tomorrow morning. On the bridge, they're changing shifts. First mate Kerry Egan will stand watch overnight, and Captain Rundle heads to his bunk behind the bridge. After 16 years at sea, Davies decided to call it quits and make this his final season. Then, around 3.30 in the morning, something isn't right. Davies! We need to get her upright. Go oh, try you! Come on! Get her back, get her back! Guys, get your suits on! Come on! Good. Only one thing might Come save on. them, survival suits. For the crew of the Arctic Rose, that time has run out. A distress signal is sent out from the Arctic Rose. The Arctic Rose's coordinates are transmitted to an overhead satellite, then relayed to the Coast Guard station in Kodiak, Alaska. More than 800 miles away, it'll take at least four hours to get there. Despite two days of intensive searching, no survivors are found. The floating immersion suits suggest someone took them out during the emergency, but there was no time to put them on. The crew of the Arctic Rose is declared lost at sea. It's the deadliest commercial fishing accident in U.S. waters in 50 years. The U.S. Coast Guard launches their highest level of investigation. Coast Guard Captain Ron Morris is assigned as the lead investigator. What could possibly create such an issue for this vessel that would go down so quickly and nobody have a chance to even say mayday? Because the accident was so deadly, the National Transportation Safety Board sends their own investigator, Bob Ford, to assist. Having no survivors also, no voyage data recorder. My first reaction was, this is almost going to be impossible to find out. What could sink the Arctic Rose so fast, the crew had no time to escape? The search for answers takes investigators to Dutch Harbor, Alaska, the main port of call for fishing vessels working the Bering Sea. Several former crew members paint a picture of an inexperienced crew working in uncomfortably cramped conditions. One person, there was a former fisherman from the Arctic Rose that was a little reluctant to talk. He said, what a hunk of junk it was. Bottom line, it was almost a form of punishment to go on the Arctic Rose. Then he mentions something that catches the investigator's attention. Any defects at all? Anything you noticed? Uh about the boat? She got rolling pretty good on heavy seas. Right. If the rolling was as bad as former crew members say, it could be a sign the boat was dangerously unstable. Investigators drilled down to learn as much as they can about the boat's design. The Arctic Rose was a trawler, but it didn't start out as a trawler. It started out as a shrimper, and it was modified more than once. Quite a few modifications. The fact the ship was altered from its original design is an important lead. Did converting the Arctic Rose into a processor make it so top-heavy 
it capsized in the rough seas? To find out, investigators meet the naval architect responsible for most of the changes. Changes to Arctic rows include adding the entire processing factory, a concrete floor to level the deck, and a massive steel gantry to haul the net. Investigators learn that although the modifications did make the boat heavier, as long as the watertight hatches were closed, the Arctic Rose was considered seaworthy and safe. Investigators are stumped. If the modifications were safe and the boat was stable, then to find out why it sank, they'll need to see the vessel for themselves. The passenger ferry, Queen of the North, is weaving its way through the rocky islands that line the west coast of Canada. Captain Colin Hanthorn is in command. Oh no! <laughs> Somehow, the Queen of the North has hit rock. Your fairy, Queen of the North, is adrift and rapidly taking on water. The bridge crew is struggling to get a handle on the emergency, and Captain Hanthorn realizes he needs to prepare for the worst. I could see my chest moving in and out with every beat of the heart. I literally thought that I would not be able to speak, but I picked up the microphone and announced all passengers and crew to come up to deck seven. Muster stations, muster stations. Proceed to lifeboat stations on deck seven. This is no drill. Time is running out. The Queen of the North is steadily sinking lower. The water level is now high enough to start flooding in over the vehicle deck. Copy that. It's above the rubbing strake. The rubbing strake is a, uh, a band of steel that runs all the way around the ship. It's like a big bumper. OK, time to go. Once that's below the water line, that ship is doomed to sink. Commence evacuation. All right, take your life jackets, keep moving. As the situation deteriorates, efforts shift from preparing to abandon ship to actually getting 101 passengers and crew into lifeboats as quickly as possible. Keep moving. Here you go, keep moving, keep moving. One raft after another was launched. Lifeboat was launched. Less than an hour after striking a rocky island, the Queen of the North is going down. She's drifted into a deeper part of the channel, and there's nothing the passengers and crew can do but watch and wait. To me, it, it seemed like more of a, a salute as she left. In the near freezing waters of the North Atlantic, the fishing boat Lady Mary and her crew of seven are near the end of their fifth day hauling scallops. The captain is Royal Smith Jr., but everyone calls him Bobo. Hey, Dad. Bobo. How y'all doing out there? Yeah, it's pretty good, Dad. Ah, uh, good, good, good. Your mama been asking for you. Tell mama we all okay? We love her. The 41-year-old captain is a third-generation fisherman. His father, Royal Senior, taught him to fish when he was a boy. <laughs> my, my boys went out during the summer. They, they, they went on the boat with their granddaddy. So. All of them know what to do. All right, Dad. I'll check in with you later. Sound good, son. Sound good. All right. Then, around 5 in the morning, something goes wrong. Damn it. The boat is listing dangerously to its port side. Come on, girl. Steady up. Steady up. Stay with me, girl. Stay with me. Damn it! Come on, girl! Captain Bobo struggles to right the ship, 
but it's not working. About an hour before sunrise, seven crew members of the Lady Mary are in a fight for their lives. The boat is sinking in the cold Atlantic. Drop your suit! It's abandoned ship! No! The boat is now listing heavily to one side. A third of the aft deck is already underwater. The Lady Mary is sinking. For those in the water, their last hope is Lady Mary's EPIRB, or Emergency Position Indicating Radio Beacon. It activates automatically to tell the Coast Guard where they are. More than 65 miles away, the Coast Guard Air Station in Atlantic City launches a search. 37 hours after the sinking, six out of seven of the crew are dead including four members of Fuzzy's family. Even in an industry so used to tragedy, it's a shocking loss. The vessel was built in 1969. Looks like the Lady Mary had some work done on her. Lady Mary was originally built in Pascagoula, Mississippi as a shrimper and was converted to harvest scallops. For investigators, it's a red flag. Changes to a boat's original design sometimes create problems with stability. A boat's ability to stay upright in the face of large waves and high winds. Investigators need to know if the conversion was done properly. They book a series of meetings with Fuzzy to find out more. Captain Smith, I'm gonna to need to see the modifications made to the Lady Mary. Fuzzy Smith and his lawyer are expecting the Coast Guard scrutiny and Fuzzy doesn't hesitate to cooperate. Fuzzy's changes included a processing area where the scallops could be cut and put on ice each day, an extension to the stern, and a new wheelhouse up on the second level. To confirm the modifications were safe, investigators want to know who designed them. Who was your naval architect? I didn't hire one. May I ask why not? I didn't need to. Fuzzy's response is troubling. Instead of hiring a naval architect, he designed almost everything himself. Despite what you think, I know what I'm doing. With all due respect, sir, that's what we're here to find out. What is this modification here? Man, I was just showing you what I'm doing to that boat. I extended the stern. Everybody quieted up, because I knew what I was talking about. I had some concrete to ballast. The more Captain Fuzzy explains what he did, the more investigators can see his changes didn't cause the accident. We can tell that Fuzzy was working hard to improve the vessel and to make it a better ship to work on. Can you see it's all in order? Fuzzy added uh, some ballast to the bottom of the vessel at the same time that he added the superstructure. And so we don't have any reason to believe that um, the stability of the vessel played a factor. Investigators are going to need another lead. December 28th, 2014. The passenger ferry Norman Atlantic is fighting its way through a brutal winter storm. It's the holidays and the ship is crammed to near capacity with 417 passengers. Leonidas Constantinidis has parked his truck below. Now he needs a seat. I didn't have a cabin, and there was no seating available in the lounge. The ship was suffocatingly full. It's against the rules, but in the end, Constantinidis goes down to deck four. Captain, we've got the fire alarm on deck four. Still in his truck, Leonidas discovers he's surrounded by flames. Then mix it up. I couldn't remember where the exit was. I had to decide, go forward or back. 
The blaze has driven Leonidas Constantinidis all the way to the back of the ship. It's the end of the road. Then, he has a stroke of luck. There's a cable dangling from the ship down into the sea, a possible escape route from the raging fire. It was a choice between getting burnt or drowning. I grabbed the cable and went down into the sea. I chose the water instead of the fire. By 11.30 in the morning, the Norman Atlantic has been burning for six hours. Coast Guard vessels have arrived to start rescuing passengers and crew. One of them is Leonidas Constantinidis, who'd been driven by fire into the sea seven hours earlier. I wasn't wearing a life jacket or anything. I only stayed above the surface because I was hugging the cable. Miraculously, the wind from the storm blew a stray life raft right to him. The life raft, the way the wind was pushing it, it had to pass between the cable I was holding and the ship. Somehow, he made it on board. Five days after the fire, the Norman Atlantic Ferry is finally cool enough for investigators to go on board. It's their first glimpse of where the tragedy began. Some walls on the ship were still glowing with lots of smoke coming out. All the shell from the inside was completely deformed. From what they're seeing, investigators estimate temperatures reached more than 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. Their best chance of finding out what happened on the ship lies with the crew. The fire spread at a lightning speed. The crew is at a loss to explain the blaze. It came out of nowhere. I noticed some uh, smoke on the starboard side uh, near a truck on deck four. Look, electrical system. Yes, electrical. Investigators are surprised any refrigerator truck was running its diesel generator during the voyage. There's a good reason why diesel generators shouldn't be used aboard ship. Poorly running diesels can emit dangerous sparks from their exhaust ports. Not so bad on the open road, but in a densely packed hold, it's a hazard. A review of the ship's plans adds more to the theory. There were 40 power outlets available on deck four, but on the night of the fire, there were 47 refrigerator trucks squeezed onto that deck. Investigators now have a working theory about how the fire began. But how did it get so large and out of control so fast? Look, look at the bird. Kiaia and his team scrutinize the blackened trucks and notice something unusual. Have you ever seen heat pattern like this? Never. Look. Significant heat damage at the bottom of the vehicles. How it make like this? It was very, very uh, surprising. Normally, as you know, heat goes up. But what we found, it was strong damage even in the lower part of the trucks. We had some tires, the wheel, the, the metal part of the wheel completely melted. Somehow this fire filled the hold with super hot flames from the top all the way to the bottom. This was unbelievable. Hurricane Alley in the North Atlantic is famous for its storms. And right now, the crew of the 790-foot container ship El Faro has already changed course to avoid a big one, Tropical Storm Joaquin. El Faro is about halfway into a two and a half day weekly run from Jacksonville, Florida to San Juan, Puerto Rico. But by one in the morning, they're hitting the edges of the storm. Then it gets worse. 
Please be advised Hurricane Joaquin has been upgraded to a Category 3 storm. In less than 24 hours, Joaquin has grown from a Category 1 to a powerful Category 3 hurricane. Near its center, it's producing sustained winds of 115 miles an hour. Oh my God. At 4 a.m., Chief Mate Steve Schultz is standing watch on the bridge, and able seaman Frank Hamm is at the helm. Down in the engine room, alarms are going off. Damn it! I think we just lost the plant. At the worst possible time, the ship's main engine sputters and shuts down. The engineers need to restore the oil pressure if they are to have any hope of restarting the engine. Without power, El Faro is at the mercy of the hurricane's enormous waves. The situation is critical. With a dead ship in a violent storm, starting the engine is their only hope to survive. No matter what they do, the engineers can't get the engine back online. El Faro could capsize any moment. The captain has no choice but to activate the automated Mayday signal. All right, let's push the button. The stress button's been activated. It's the last signal ever received from El Faro. Bring the abandoned ship. Seven hours after it capsized, the Marine Electric finally disappears into the Atlantic. 31 members of the Marine Electric's crew of 34 are dead, including Captain Philip Coral. Why did the Marine Electric, a ship that had sailed through rough seas for nearly 40 years, capsize and sink to the bottom of the Atlantic? Look here. Let's see where we are on this. In Portsmouth, Virginia, the U.S. Coast Guard immediately convenes a Marine board to investigate the disaster. Captain Peter Lauritsen is in charge. The Coast Guard has the authority to investigate Marine casualties. The Coast Guard office sent investigators out immediately, and so they were, they were gathering information, and they were feeding it to us. The inquiry will consider everything from the ship's structural integrity to human error. Divers survey the wreck and discover the hull in several large pieces on the seafloor, presenting Lords in his first possible cause, its cargo of nearly 25,000 tons of coal. The heavy cargoes that bulk carriers contain have to be loaded in just the right way, or it can put a huge strain on the ship's structure and even break it in half. Lauritsen checks the crew's loading records, but there's no sign they made any mistakes. Number two. The cargo wasn't too heavy, and the holds were loaded in the correct order to avoid straining the ship. One. That's the sequence of the loading. Meanwhile, the ship's owner, Marine Transport Lines, goes public with its theory about what went wrong. In all accidents, you're going to get all sorts of theories. You're going to have all sorts of interests protecting their own interests. Fishing vessel Theodora is in distress. We got to lend a hand. Where were they when you saw them? Around here. The theory that the company came up with is that when we went to the Theodora, we got ourselves into too shallow a water and we pounded the bottom. Okay, let's hear what we got. The Coast Guard listens to recordings of the captain's radio calls, relaying the Marine Electric's position during the Theodora rescue to verify if the theory is true. They listen carefully as the captain reports his position. Coast Guard, this is Marine Electric. We are at position. Three, seven degrees, five, zero point one minutes north. Seven, four degrees, 
53.6 minutes west. And then check that position on the navigation chart. 53.6 minutes west. west. There's no sign the captain steered the ship into trouble. They were in good water. The survivors tell the same story. They didn't hear or feel anything indicating they had run aground. Lauritsen and his team will have to find another theory to explain why the Marine Electric went down, taking 31 men along with it. 17 years after the tragic loss of the Derbyshire and her 44 passengers and crew, the answers may finally be within reach. Investigators guide a remote camera vehicle two and a half miles below the surface of the Pacific Ocean. They need to know why the largest British ship ever lost at sea went down. Really torn apart. Look at that. The giant ship has been shattered into over 2,000 pieces of twisted metal and debris. Andy Bowen has examined many shipwrecks, but he's never seen anything like this before. I think everyone was staggered by the fact that it covered such a large area. The bow and the stern of the ship were in two separate places separated by a significant distance. And everything else in between, all of the ship's structure, was for the most part turned into what I, I, I would almost call confetti. The twisted metal fragments are a telltale sign of a violent phenomenon that can tear a ship apart. When the Derbyshire sank, because of its unique construction of a double hull, uh, it actually did something, which is to implode and then explode. As the Derbyshire sank below the waves, increased water pressure drove her watertight double hulls inward. At that point, the trapped air became so highly compressed, it exploded. It, it explodes back out in a shock wave. And that energy release was probably equivalent to many tons of TNT. And so the wreckage on the seafloor was uh, just huge pieces of ship twisted by uh, energy that just is almost impossible to imagine. In other words, the explosions were the result of the catastrophe, not the cause. Investigators still have no idea what set off the disaster. October 15th, 2003. The Andrew J. Barberi, one of the biggest ships in the Staten Island fleet, is getting ready to leave Manhattan's Whitehall Terminal for its three o'clock sailing. Once the passenger decks have been secured, a deckhand comes up to serve as a lookout, an extra pair of eyes to scan the harbor. 15 minutes in. Approaching the KV buoy, Jersey side. Yeah. Got it. The KV buoy marks the entry into the Kill Van Cull Channel and the approach to the Staten Island Ferry Terminal. A few minutes from now, when they approach the terminal, the ferry will have to pull into one of the narrow slips. On a windy day like today, that will take some especially deft maneuvering. The gap is barely wider than the ship. And we started to walk to the front of the boat. But the odd thing was, this guy is running by toward the back of the boat, passing us. And I thought that was odd. When it shifts and slows up, you know you're coming in. And um, it never slowed up. I couldn't figure out why it wasn't slowing down. And then as we were getting closer, it seemed like it was picking up more speed. The ferry shows no sign of stopping. What the, what the? Oh. Everybody back! The vessel has ground to a stop alongside a concrete maintenance pier, with its side torn wide open. The injured passengers need help. For many, time is running out. 
I need your help. With the ferry's wrecked side against the maintenance pier, no one can get on or off the ship. Somehow, Captain Gansis has to get the ferry over to the slips so first responders can board. We need to switch over the controls. You stay here. I'm heading over to the Manhattan side. The captain's plan is to get his ship clear of the maintenance pier, turn it, and then dock it by its undamaged end. Captain Gansis is back in the Manhattan pilot house, but he can't start piloting yet. Yep. Okay, I'm in position. First, he and the engineer have to switch control over to that end of the ship. You have the command. Captain Gansis has got his ferry away from the pier and out into the harbor. Now he can attempt to turn it around. Stand by the dock. With the ferry safely in the slip, first responders can finally board. They race onto the ship to search for survivors. Investigators need to board too. More than 80 people are injured, 11 of them fatally. All right, walk us through. Where were you and what did you see? The senior mate of the Andrew J. Barberi was right there when the ferry rammed a maintenance pier, killing 11 people and injuring dozens more. Captain Michael Gansett wasn't in the Staten Island pilot house. He should have been with Assistant Captain Smith during the docking, but he wasn't. Investigators learned some captains would stay at the other end of the ferry and wait there to take the helm for the return trip. The assistant captain was left alone at the helm, piloting a ship with 1,500 passengers on board. And from where the senior mate was sitting, he couldn't see well enough to help. I don't really know what happened. It just, nothing out of the ordinary. And then, bang. Well, I appreciate your time. Investigators have gotten a glimpse into the flawed day-to-day -day operations on the Staten Island ferries. 